Well, this is Dr. Stan here at Greater Liberty, coming to you from the hills overlooking beautiful and picturesque Monterey Bay and, and bringing you the news behind the news, the story behind the story, hoping to convince you that reality is usually scoffed at and that illusion is usually king. But in the battle for the survival of Western civilization, it's going to be reality and not illusion or delusion that's going to determine what the future will bring. And I have to remind you the views expressed here are not necessarily those of the owners, management, staff, sponsors, or supporters of the station you're listening to. They happen to be my views, and well, for the next hour, they're going to be the views of L.A. Marzulli, and we're going to be talking about... Watcher 6. And that's uh, Lynn's latest book, LA's latest book. And, and basically, you know, have you ever thought that uh, if there were really giants in America at one time, that you wouldn't have heard of them? Uh, giants were 8 feet tall, 10 feet tall, 12 feet tall, 16 feet tall. How could you conceal something like that? Well, very simply, ladies and gentlemen, your reality is created by the people who control the media, and the people who control the media have an agenda, and there's so much about the history of the, the America, the, uh, of our nation, that you will never hear about, and especially the spir spiritual implications of what's going on. L.A., you pick up the story from there. Well, first of all, Dr. Stan, thanks so much for having me on the show. It's been a while, and uh, it's good to be back here again, and of course, I'll see you at the Colorado Springs Conference coming up on the Friday this week, and I think there's like 25 speakers, <clears throat> excuse me, 25 speakers who will be participating in that, and it's uh, it's really going to be a fun fun uh, three or four days. So well, you know, that, that. that is the most amazing thing, L.A. Those are some of the finest speakers in the country, and I mean, people, Chuck Messer will be there, and Tom Horn, and you, and so many of the people of, of regular guests on Radio Liberty are all going to be there. There are going to be over, well over a thousand people in the audience there for a three-day conference, and a lot of people are going to be watching this on television at home as well. I'm amazed that there's this much interest. I'm flattered to be uh, asked to be at one of the speakers, and really looking forward to seeing you and the other leaders in this effort to warn people about the spiritual implications of what's coming down the line. But you pick up the story. Thank you so much. Well, um, this all started off with a, a trip to Ohio at a conference about two years ago. And when I was there, uh, my colleague and friend Russ Dizdar, who will also be speaking in Colorado this weekend, said, L.A., do you know where you're going? And I said, yeah, I'm going to Newark, Ohio, Russ. And he said, well, no, do you really know where you're going? He said, you buy your computer? And I said, yeah. And he goes, type in uh, Nephilim Chronicles, Fallen Angels in the Ohio Valley. So I did that, kind of like, what the heck? And up comes this book by this author by the name of Fritz Zimmerman. And here I was going to this place, and I had no idea uh, what was actually there thousands of years before the city of Newark, Ohio, was created. And, of course, what I'm talking about specifically is the Great Circle Mountain Octagon Mountain Complex which was built about 3,000 to 3,500 years ago. And I went there, and my jaw was literally on the ground the entire weekend. I was absolutely taken aback. I got a hold of Fritz Zimmerman. I made another trip back there several months later, and Fritz and I spent um, several days looking at everything and walking the mounds. And he was, I read his book and, 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 and started doing my own digging. Well, you know, I had thought that I had really done everything I was going to do with the Nephilim. And I guess God had other plans because what I realize now is I barely scratched the surface with the uh, with the first five books, um, which are worth reading. I'm not I'm not dismissing them, but this book uh, on the trail of the Nephilim has opened up uh, just entirely new vistas for me and frankly for the reader. And what we've what we've what we're trying to do, of course, is nail it down with DNA testing. We've done some testing, uh, which is actually not in the book, but is mentioned in Watcher Six. I speak, of course, of Raman spectroscopy, and we'll get into that maybe a little bit later. But what, we, what, we've, what we've discovered and what the concept is this, that the Smithsonian Institute and other institutions in academia have attempted at all costs to uphold the Darwinian paradigm, which is sacrosanct to them. Okay, well, what? hold that thought. We'll yes. be back in just a moment with L.A. Marzulli, one of the most amazing stories you'll ever hear. L.A., you go right ahead. And thank you, Dr. Stan. And what we realized was that um, 
the remains that were found, and we have article after article after article. Uh, we've had doctors, and you're a doctor, so you, you know, you know, you're an MD. And what what the what we discover is that these men of letters, a hundred years ago or earlier, look at these skeletons, and we're absolutely taken aback by what they were saying. We have reports from the short ones are seven feet; they go all the way up to twelve feet. That's just in the Ohio Valley area and and other other surrounding areas. But we'll just stick with Ohio because that's that's where we sort of that's where I sort of concentrated the initial part of the study. Um, what we discovered was that these bones and these remains were collected by teams that were sent out from the Smithsonian Institute. This is undisputed. These bones were collected. Uh, they were supposed to be displayed. Of course, they never were. And now the Smithsonian and other so-called archaeologists who hold the Darwinian paradigm uh, refuse or just say, well, those bones uh, really never existed and that these doctors 100 years ago really didn't know how to measure and I just found that so intellectually dishonest and so disingenuous. And, and I, I, I literally, I had a conversation with an archaeologist, a tenured professor of archaeology at a major university. And I asked he or she, because I'm not going to divulge, you know, whether it was a man or woman, I just keep the person as anonymous as possible. But I asked he or she um, what they thought about men of letters over 100 years ago measuring disarticulated skeletons. And they told me that back then they didn't know how to measure. And I just literally fell out of my chair. And, I, and my rebuttal was, you're trying to tell me that a medical doctor 120, even 130, 40 years ago would not know how to measure using, using a ruler or a tape, a disarticulated or an articulated skeleton. I mean, it's just absolute nonsense. And granted, you know, doctors, let's say during the Civil War, didn't have the medical... Um, um, accoutrements that we have today, we get that. But they were they were educated men, and surely they knew a giant or a, from a disarticulated skeleton by measuring the femur bone and, and estimating by the size of the femur bone, which is the thigh bone, how big that person could have been in life. And I, look, we have report after report after report. We had probably 250 of them. I hired a a, a man who goes into the archives and goes back and and looks at all the old papers. And he sent me approximately 250 articles, all talking about giants between 7 and 12 feet tall, found all throughout the Americas. There's actually some out here in Catalina, right outside my window, Catalina hold, Island. Hold, nine, that, nine hold, that thought, hold that thought. We'll be back in just a moment here. Well, this is Dr. Stan, and L.A. is simply saying that uh, when he went to Ohio, why, of course, they found evidence that, that there had been uh, really uh, this race of people living there 3,500 years ago. Now, how do you put that in perspective? Well, that's about the time, certainly, that uh, that basically Moses was actually uh, going into the land of Israel. That was about 1,500 years B.C. That's about 3,500 years ago. Well, certainly there were things here in America at that time, and basically what happened was probably close to 100 years ago, why the Smithsonian Institute sent their agents out to collect these bones of, of the giants, and many of them were up to 12 feet tall, and they were to be put on display, but there's been an organized effort to deceive the public, and basically, of course, these bones of Sydney were never displayed, and now they're denied that they ever were found. And yet, of course, L.A. had actually employed a gentleman who went through the ancient records, old records, uh, written 100, 120, 2550 years ago and found over 250 references to these skeletons of these giants that existed here in America uh, 3500 years ago. So why is there this effort to cover this up? Well, L.A. believes this is, well, it has to do with the Darwin's concept and it may well be. Or there may be other things but the important thing is they're lying to the American public about the fact that these giants existed or that they were here. And of course, many people believe that these are Nephilim that these are the offspring of these demonic forces, and perhaps this is the reason that the people from the Smithsonian and other scientific, so-called scientific organizations don't want you to know, because the last thing they would want you to know is there's any validity to the stories in the scriptures. So go right ahead, Ellie. That was a great summation, <laughs> Dr. Stan, incredible. I'm going to read you just a couple of clippings. Uh, this is from May 31st, 1919. Seymour, Texas, May 30th, oil drillers claim to have found bones of a prehistoric giant 10 feet high. Mexico City, August 17th, 1922. 
The Department of Agriculture yesterday received from an agent in Tiburon Island, Gulf of California, the skeleton of a primitive man more than 10 feet tall. It was found a few days ago. Other bones of similar size have been encountered. February 2nd, 1909, the skeleton of a prehistoric man of large size has been found in a town 10 miles southeast of the city of Mexico. According to a news received here yesterday, the discovery was made by a peon who went for a skeleton which measured about 15 feet in height. goes from there. September 27th, 1924, a dispatch from Casopolis, Missouri, says that an opening amount near Diamond Lake Wednesday, a giant of prehistoric race was unearthed. The bones of the skeleton are well preserved. A lower jaw is immense. An ordinary jawbone fits inside with ease. By measurement, the distance from the top of the skull to the upper end of the thigh bone is 5 feet 5 inches. A doctor who was present stated that the man must have been 11 feet tall. And yet, of course, Dr. Stan, when you talk about talk about this to archaeologists, they, they fall back on, well, these medical doctors in 1920, because that, that was, um, let me see, that was 1924, so that's less than 100 years ago. So that doctor did not know how to measure an articulated or a disarticulated skeleton. In other words, here's, here's a man that's trained. Um, he, he knows anatomy. That's, that's, and I don't have to tell you this. You know that you know anatomy. You have to. And he estimates this being was 11 feet tall. Well, look, if it was one story, we dismiss it. But there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of stories like this. Obviously, someone or a group of people are attempting to obfuscate what is really happening and keep it from the American public and from people. Why? Very simple reason, because it goes against the Darwinian paradigm and shows that there is a supernatural, as you've mentioned many times, Dr. Stead, on your show, and that supernatural coincides with the biblical narrative that tells us that the fallen angels had sex with the women, the Nephilim were the offspring of that, and as you pointed out, about 3,500 years ago, the diaspora of the Levant, or which is known as the Promised Land, happened when, when Joshua and Caleb pressed into what is known as the Promised Land. There were Nephilim tribes there. There's a mandate that's given from a loving, holy God to wipe them all out. Men, women, children, animals, burn everything. And that does not go really well with, uh, you know, the God of love, does it? So there's something else in operation here. And most biblical scholars can't reconcile that and figure out what is really going on. The moment we plug the Nephilim, the progeny of the fallen angels, everything begins to make sense. And there are over 20 Nephilim tribes in this area. And Dr. Stan, they don't all look alike. That's why there's different tribes. They all have different genetic characteristics. And yet the mandate is to wipe them all out. And there's a reason for that. Again, because these are demonic hybrid creatures which were never supposed to exist, and that's why the finality of a judgment, there's not a shred of grace and mercy, and yet conversely, there's grace and mercy that is shown to Nineveh, and these guys invented the word barbarian. Uh, they would, When you went to Nineveh in the ancient world, you saw a row of stakes around the city, and on every one of those stakes were the deca decapitated head of a victim. They would, they would flay their... Uh, their uh, captives alive and tack the skins up on the wall. These people invented the word barbarian, and yet God sends Jonah to preach to them. Grace and mercy is extended to the people of Nineveh, and they do repent, by the way. But you never, ever, where the Nephilim are there in the flood in Sodom and Gomorrah, in the conquest of Canaan, that olive branch, that, that grace and mercy is never, ever extended to the Nephilim. And so as Joshua and Caleb come into the Promised Land, the tribes begin to migrate in panic. Some of them go north through Europe and wind up in, in the Ohio Valley. Others, and, and Thor Heyerdahl all proved this, I got it, it, it's in my book, On the Trail with the Nephilim, they sailed across the Atlantic and wound up in South America. And they began to create what we call, what I call, Nephilim architecture. The architecture, Dr. Stan, that, I, that is in the Ohio Valley, you can only see it from the air, and it is done with mathematical precision. Also, there was human sacrifice found on that site that was on earth on that site. Native Americans, uh, when asked, did, did you create these, they denied it. Go back when, when the white men first started. It was there. When, when they came into the land, 
these these sites were already there. No, no. Let me repeat that. Basically, LA is saying, look, when the when the when the Indian Indians came, the American Indians came into this area, the sites were already there. In other words, they came in after the Nephilim had been there and it had died out. But the Nephilim were there, these giants. And basically, how could you conceal something like that? Well, basically, if you read uh, LA's book, and uh, it's called Watcher Sick, We Carry It. We think it's an important book. There is actual reproduction of page after page after page of newspaper articles, uh, you know, from a hundred years ago, and all talking about these giants that have been found. But you're never going to see this mentioned in textbooks. You're never going to see this discussed on university campuses, because university campuses are dedicated to one thing, that's destroying faith in God and convincing people that evolution is a reality. And certainly the idea that man was created or there's a spiritual battle going on, that has to be totally suppressed. And boy, do they do a good job of it, because the average student can come out of university and have no idea about the truth of what's going on. In fact, it took me a decade or more to unlearn all the things I'd been conditioned to believe when I was certainly in college. But go right ahead. Well, the, the, yeah, let me, let me pick it up from there, because it, it gets even better. What we find, Dr. Stan, is that these, these giants were everywhere in the Americas. I actually spoke uh, to a, uh, a full-blooded Native American, First Nation person, Robert Mirabal. <clears throat> and when I saw his, his pageant, this guy's a Grammy Award-winning musician. And he has a, a troop of, of musicians and actors that travel with him, and they reenact these stories <clears throat> that have been passed down orally. From grandson to, or from grandfather or great, 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 great grandfather, down it goes. <clears throat> These stories go back hundreds and hundreds of years. And so I'm watching this. Someone sent me the link, and I'm watching this thing by Robert Mirabal. And he starts off, and he basically says, and I, I write this in the book, Amateur with the Nephilim Verbatim. A long time ago, the people from the sky came and saw the daughters of men and women, and, and they had union with them, and sons and daughters were born to them, and giants were in the land. Dr. Stan, it mirrors our Genesis 6 account almost verbatim. And when I called Robert and I said, where did you get this story? He said his grandfather told it to him. Well, where did he get it? His grandfather told it to him, and back and back and back it goes. It's the oral tradition. I was just in, and this will be in Volume 2, uh, several months back I was in uh, Navajo country, and I sat down with a, a woman who heard the same kind of a story through her grandmother, oral tradition, about the giants in Milan. It's there. It's there. It's not fantasy. It's not, you know, superstition. It's funny. When you talk to the archaeologists about this, and not all of them, I'm sort of painting with a broad brush, but, oh, well, that's superstition. We can't, we can't uh, discount that. And yet when you say, wait a minute, you know, the American Indians say they didn't build the Great Circle Mound or the Octagon Mound. These people didn't, didn't have math mathematics, which, which is needed to build these structures. They didn't have this stuff. Well, you're a racist by saying that. And yet you're not a racist when you point out, hey, the oral tradition is supporting that they're giants in the land. Then these same archaeologists will turn, flip the tables and go, you're a racist because you believe that they didn't build the mounds, but they're not a racist by saying that the oral tradition doesn't, doesn't hold water. It's like, what? You know, once again, falling out of my chair. And speaking with Robert Mirabal and talking to this Navajo uh, elderist at, at the Navajo Indian Reservation, Something is going on that, that goes back about 3,000 years. And what it does is it, it bolsters the biblical worldview, Dr. Stan. And we, we, from there, we went to Peru. I'm kind of jumping here a little bit. But all this is sealed up like a drum, literally. It's tight in the United States. You can't see anything. Now, recently, I've, I've had, um, and this will be in Volume 2, I've had two doors that have opened for me. I'll be traveling to a, an undisclosed uh, site where I'll be looking at a journal from the 1920s where a particular person apparently unearthed nine to ten footers. The journal has never been seen by anyone. It's held in a museum. No one has photographed it. No one has read through it, best of my knowledge. I'll also be flying to another state in the Midwest where I've been, I've been granted access into the archives to explore a, a dig that happened in the 20s where, once again, Nine to ten footers were unearthed, and apparently there were pictures, but who knows? Most of this stuff has been sanitized. When I was down at UCLA several months back to look at the collection um, of, of, of supposedly artifacts that were dug out from a site in Southern California, 
it was sanitized. Part of the collection is England, the other part is in France, and what I got to look at here was strictly Native American. So everything here is under lock and key. The American public never sees doodly squat as to what's going on. But here's where Hold that thought. Hold the thought. <laughs> Go right ahead, Ellie. Here's where it gets interesting. When I was at the Field Museum in Chicago, and we're, we're walking through the American Native American First Nation uh, exhibit, and there's this very large spearhead, and this spearhead is really, really big, and a five foot six Native American is not going to be throwing this thing around. So what, what it says on the little placard underneath it, this spearhead is ceremonial. Well, well, says who is ceremonial? How do these people know and get this, Dr. Stan? This is taken from the so-called Hopi. This is how absurd it gets. The spearhead is found in the mound builders of the Hopewell culture. Well, Hopewell was a farmer. So, this, first of all, these people were never called the Hopewell, but that's okay. That's the name that they gave them. No one knows where these people went to, where they came from, what their civilization was. And yet they make these, these ridiculous statements, in my opinion, like, well, this spear was ceremonial. Why don't you tell us and, and, and be honest about it? And I tried to find this out, got nowhere. Where did the spear originate from? Was it in a mound? And if it was in a mound, was it next to a skeleton? And if it was next to a skeleton, how big was this guy? We have, and, and what I did right after that, we went back into our records, and sure enough, we found nine-footers, ten-footers, with copper armor, with very large weapons next to them, buried in the mound. So one, one spearhead, Sort of, you look at it and they say ceremonial purposes. Well, that's, you know, if you don't even know the names of the people, how then can you possibly make that conclusion that this is ceremonial? What if it came from a mound that held a nine-footer? Now, all of a sudden, this, this spearhead is no longer ceremonial. It is, in fact, utilitarian. And that's the paradigm we're working with, that these giants fled the Promised Land. They settled here in America and also settled in Peru. And what we found there was absolutely astonishing. Well, what did you find in Peru? Well, we went there because, I, once again, someone sent me a video. I have all these, little, all these people who sent, like, little spiders that go out on the web, and they're always sending me links, and I can't get to all of them. And sometimes the one that they, when they, when they send to me are life-changing, and the one that this particular person, I have no idea who sent it to me, was a shot of this man by the name of Brian Forrester, who I actually dedicated on the trail of a Nephilim too, and Brian was our guide, and is featured heavily in Watcher Six: The Secret Cosmic War. And when we were in Peru, um, what led us there was Brian made these videos, uh, and he's in Paracas, Peru, which is a, a coastal city, and he's showing these elongated skulls. And we're just going, "What is this?" So we hopped on a plane. We, when I say we, Judd Burton, who's a, who's a, a history, a, a tenure professor, he's also an archaeologist. Um, he's an anthropologist, he's a history professor, the guy's got multiple degrees. Joe Taylor, who heads up the Mount Blanco Museum, he, uh, he is an expert cast, uh, caster. He has cast dinosaurs and mastodons and saber-toothed tigers, which are in museums all over the world. The man is incredible at what he does. <coughs> Excuse me, let me get some water here. <coughs> Ron Moorhead who's an adventurer and private pilot, and, of course, Richard Shaw and myself. Richard is the co-producer and director of the Watchers series. Well, we flew to Peru, we met Brian, and we went to the museum in Lima, where they supposedly had a room of elongated skulls. Guess what, Dr. Scam? That room was under construction, and it had been so uh, for about four months, and those skulls, which, which we went to see, were no longer there. They were Hold in the back thought. room. Hold that thought. We'll be right back. Well, this is Dr. Stan, and L.A. is simply saying that uh, since he began talking about these uh, giants and uh, writing about them and doing videos on them, why he starts getting information from various people. And basically, uh, he was actually uh, told about these uh, elongated skulls in Peru. And so he went down there uh, thinking he was going to get, be able to see them in the museum. But apparently, they'd been uh, locked away uh, for several months. And so he at least well, initially wasn't 
able to see the, the uh, elongated skulls, but were these actually uh, simply uh, elongated simply intentionally? In other words, did they bind the heads to do this? Or were these simply abnormal skulls because these belong to Nephilim or to giants of some sort? What do we know about these skulls? Well, it was interesting. Uh, I also went, wanted to see the two, what is called the two golden mummies, which were openly on display at the Lehman Museum. And these... these um, these mummies, Dr. Stan, were seated, and they were over nine feet tall. They're gone. So we see that the window is closing. So we drove out to Paracas. We were able to actually well, handle... Well, L.A., before, uh, before you go on, yes. what happened to the sitting, uh, th these nine-foot giants? No one knows. Just, just like, the, just like the, uh, the Museum of Anthropology in Lima, that room that had all the elongated skulls, shut down, can't see it. You know, we were there. We, we talked to one of the... Um, um, not docents, but one of the people that were that works in the museum. They have ten thousand skeletons and three hundred mummies. And where are they? They're in the back. Can we see them? No, you can't see them. Once again, the doors are closed. Can't see anything. But the private museum, which is where we wound up going, they still have the artifacts, Doctor Stan. And that's why we went to Paracas because in Paracas there's a private museum. We got to go in there. I, it was like a kid in a candy store. And I don't mean that in a macabre sense of the wet of the word, but finally we had evidence where we could take DNA testing. We took back hair samples. We'll talk about the hair samples in a little bit. Out of the 40 skulls that we saw, about four of them displayed true genetic anomalies. The other ones were more or less head binded. But see, that brings us back to the, to the reason or to the question, why are these people emulating this shape? Why are they binding the heads of the infants to try to make this cone head? Head shape, what is desirable about them, about this shape? And we actually saw um, the, the actual um, device which is used to bind the, the child's head, the infant's head. Uh, that's, a picture of that is also in the book. It, that particular device was found in the Chongos graveyard, which is this ancient, ancient graveyard, thousands of years old, where we, we got to walk around and see it, the most bizarre place I've ever been, Potsherds everywhere, human remains, bits of skeleton, entire skulls. I mean, it, it's like it's like a nightmare. It really is, and it's it's a desert, Doctor Stan. As far as you can see, it's just this just this white sand. Looks like the Sahara. No, about a quarter of an inch, maybe a year of rainfall there. So everything is in a perfect place of preservation. And the skulls that we were handling were literally thousands of years old, literally. And we got to weigh them, handle them, test them, look at them. And what makes these skulls very unique, and as a, obviously as a medical doctor, you know where I'm going with this, but some of the larger skulls, and we could tell pretty much the difference between the male and the female skulls. The males, uh, the maxilla and the mandible, much more robust. Uh, there were brow ridges uh, right in the brow, very pronounced brows, almost like what you would consider Cro-Magnum. But in, in the ones that were not cradle headboard boarded, the genetic anomaly seemed to be the absence of two parietal plates. The human skull has four plates, the frontal plate, the two parietal, and the occipital plate in the rear. And these are all sort of stitched together. They call them sutures. And they are sutures. They hold the plates together. And that parietal plate, uh, when a child is born, um, there's a hole there. It's called a fontanelle, and that is open. As a child grows older, that fontanelle, of course, closes. Well, that parietal suture extends from the frontal plate to the occipital plate. And, is, and when a person gets maybe 80 or 90 years old, some of that suture disappears. But guess what? There's always a trace. Well, I, I went and Joe Taylor are, made a cast of what we believe is a female. I'm looking at it right now. And I've taken this to two different uh, dentists who have examined the teeth. And because of the wisdom teeth come in between 18 and 25, they're able to ascertain that this skull, because there are no wisdom teeth, um, and in fact, one of them shows a little bit of a bud coming in. One one dentist believed that this skull is about between 18 and 25. Doctor Stan, it shows no sign of a parietal suture. None. There's only one parietal plate instead of the two parietal plates. So the skull that I'm the cast that I'm looking at in Joe Taylor of the Mount Blanca Museum did the cast. It'll be um, at at Colorado, Doctor Stan. I can't wait for you to really look at it and and see it firsthand. But we believe this is a female, and we think that the, the hypothesis that we're going on is that there's genetic manipulation that's happening to these people. 
It makes it's even more mysterious. Now, is, are these Ma Mayan people? Are these no. Inca people? Are these they predate those uh, Indian? Yeah, they do. They're completely. So predated. basically, this is the thing you're not supposed to understand. I mean, the Mayans were there; they disappeared. The Incas were there; they disappeared. But here's another group that disappeared long before. We'll be back in a moment. Well, LA, you go right ahead. Well, thanks, Doctor Stan. So we're we're down in Peru. And we're looking at these elongated skulls, and we realize that the genetic anomalies that are there. Um, I've had three medical doctors look at them, and Dr. Stan, when you look at the, the cast, that will be four. All of them agree that there's something going on. They're not sure what it is. We need DNA testing. One thing we were able to do was bring back hair samples from one of the skulls. And this skull is at least a 1,000 years old. Um, there's no way to tell exactly how old it is. But it's anywhere from 1,000 to 3,000 years old. It was found with a, as an infant. And when we go back in January, uh, Dr. Stam, and I'll show you, there's a picture of that in the book on the trail. Uh, there's a picture of the, the infant skull, which, is, which has this very elaborate textile wrapped around it. Well, Senior Juan has given us permission, and Joe Taylor knows how to do this, and so does, of course, uh, we'll, we're down there with two archaeologists this time, uh, Judd Burton, and we will be able to soak this in a special solution and remove the binding or remove this textile from the head. And the reason we're doing this is because this skull is an infant skull and it's already elongated. And, and this sort of like blows the whole idea of cradle headboarding. But we were able to take uh, a hair, and this is where it gets really bizarre, but it ties in with my work. And Dr. Stan, I've been on your show many times, so... Uh, and I've talked about UFOs and the alien abduction phenomena and what we, what we believe is happening there, the implants, the genetic engineering, which is happening now. Remember, Jesus says it will be like the days of Noah when I return, which points us back to the days of Noah and begs the question, what differentiates those days from any other in all of history is the presence of the Nephilim are on the earth. Uh, genetic uh, but just for the listeners out there, that this is not to suggest that L.A. is saying that the aliens are real. He believes no. in the diplomatic manifestations. And this is really what's so important. All of this talk about <coughs> UFOs is to mislead people and take them away from the real understanding of what's going on. Go right ahead. Well, we sat there and we, we brought back this sort of reddish auburn hair. First of all, it's not dyed. Native Americans did not have reddish hair. So whoever these Paracas people were came from someplace else and settled here about 3,500 years ago. Hold that thought, hold that thought, and we'll be back in just a <laughs> moment here. Well, this is Dr. Stan, and suddenly L.A. is simply saying that uh, when they were suddenly in Peru at the private, uh, the private museum, they were able actually to actually uh, to get a hair, and the hair is a reddish hair now. Suddenly, the Mayans, the Incas, the other people didn't have reddish hair, so obviously if this uh, is reddish hair, and this goes back to suddenly... Uh, 3,500 years or so ago, when, of course, the, the, this skeleton was a live human being, or perhaps it was a Nephilim. We don't know, and they're going to do a lot more in the way of study on this and DNA analysis. But fascinating information to realize that long before there was the Incas and the Mayas, there was another race here, and, of course, it's Lens. The L.A.'s uh, certainly contention. These could very well have been the Nephilim who actually fled the Holy Land Ahead, uh, after Jericho was destroyed. And, of course, uh, God had given the land uh, to the Jewish people, and they were going to claim it. And so the Nephilim simply fled, and uh, they fled, of course, across the ice uh, so they, uh, in the winter time and came into North America, perhaps they went by boat. Under any circumstances, they settled all over North America and all over South America. And there's an organized effort by our major museums to conceal the fact that they have these giant uh, skeletons or the background of this other race. You're not supposed to know these things, ladies and gentlemen. Most of what you're taught in college, most of what <laughs> you read in the newspapers, most of what you see on television is designed not to educate you, not to reveal what's gone on in the past, but to conceal it. Well, before we go on, L.A., I want you to tell our listeners how they can get to your website and uh, certainly get access to your excellent information. Thank you, Dr. Stan. It's lamarzuli.net, lamarzuli.net. You can get Watcher 6. And the new book, On the Trail of a Nephilim. By the way, Dr. Stan, it's an oversized book, eight and a half by eleven, with uh, four color printing. And the, and the, you know, I have most books, the, the pictures are in the middle. Well, I didn't want to do that. It's just so cheesy. So we spent extra money. We made an oversized book, four color printing, and the pictures are all the way through it. 
there's 120, at least 120 full colored pictures uh, that are in there that were taken on site. So you really get the viewer, when you get the book, you really get an idea of what we're talking about. So it's not a little five by eight book with a small little section of pictures or that are black and white in the center. Full color, eight and a half by 11, you really get a sense of what's going on. And that's, you save 10 bucks if you buy both of them together on the website. That's lamarzuli.net, www.lamarzuli.net. And you can avail yourself of what I believe is critical information because it really blows the lid, in my opinion, off the Darwinian paradigm and points to the biblical narrative as being the truth. Basically, of course, then you have the one book, which is called On the uh, Watch of Six, and then it's the On the Trail of the Nephilim, a, a separate book? Yes. Okay, fine. So there are two books, because we actually carry the Watcher 6. And, uh, but anyway, you go right ahead. Yeah, Watcher 6 is the DVD, and On the Trail of a Nephilim oh, is the book. Okay, fine. Well, that's, that's what we have. We actually, yeah. we actually yeah. have the book that they're talking and about. Buy from Dr. Stan, folks. Support him. Okay. Support his ministry. Well, you so go right good. ahead. So anyway, so we took the hair, and we had a, a control sample of human hair. We had a dyed human hair to see what that would look like. We had the red hair, or the so-called auburnish red hair, from the, the mummy from Paracas, Peru. That's at least a 1,000 years old. I'm being extremely conservative. It's probably closer to 3,000, but 1,000 to 2,000 years. Let's just call it a nap. And then, and then we, we had a, because of our, our lab assistant and because of what we travel in and do, a man had been abducted, Dr. Stan, and he had been forced to have sex with a hybrid being. And I realized that sounds crazy. Okay. But we have the hair from the hybrid female, which he had the presence of mind when he awakened that morning to keep. It's, it's blonde, very blonde, almost whitish in color. So we took these hair samples, and we, we went into a machine called Raman spectroscopy, which measures the molecular structure of whatever you're examining and plots it out on a graph so you can see what it looks like, okay? And the human hair just kind of does a nice little inverted U. It just kind of comes up, does a little U, and then trails off, all right? The dyed hair comes in at the same place the human hair, but goes right up to the, to the top of the chart and is gone. This is where it gets interesting. The hybrid hair, the white hair, and the reddish hair from Paracas, the slope on the graph, they track Dr. Stan, and I'll show that in Colorado, and it's in Watcher 6. It'll also be in Volume 2. Because so it's so important, and 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 I've I've showed this to um, a pastor actually who knew a lot about Raman spectroscopy. This is what his degree was. It was in was in biology. And when I showed him this, he said, it, "It's it you you can't you can't look at this and know anything about what Raman spectroscopy is and understand that scientifically there's there's got to be a connection between this so-called hybrid hair and this 2,000 year old mummy hair from Paracas." There's a definite connection because the slopes match. Every little jot and tittle, every every move, they match. So there's, there's a correlation between the hybrid hair and the mummy hair. And, of course, we are desperately trying to get DNA samples to do DNA testing um, because that will be, that's sort of, that's the final word. Until we get the DNA testing, we don't know. But that that's what we've discovered. That's what's in the book. Um, and, and, you know, not only that, Dr. Stamp, but when we went to places like Sakse Waman, Oyez and Tambo, Waitara, all, all very strange sounding names. And, and we flew to Nikusko and we went to a place called Sakse Waman. And it's about 12,000 feet above sea level. Very difficult to move. Well, at 12,000 feet above sea level, there was this very large wall complex. It's called Sakse Waman. And in it were these stones. And these stones were placed with such precision, without mortar. And the cuttings of the stone are polygonal. In other words, there's multi-sides to the stones. And these cuts go all the way through the stones. Yet, the stones were quarried 40 to 60 miles away and somehow moved and fitted to the site at, at, at 12,000 feet above sea level. The joints are so fine that you cannot stick a piece of paper through it, even a human hair. That's how tight the joints are. And what's amazing about this, we saw this in Cusco, we saw it again in Oyez and Tambo, we saw it at Saksi Waman, at Waitara. Whoever is building this is using building techniques 
that you would be hard pressed. It would cost millions of dollars, millions and millions of dollars, to be able to duplicate the stonework. And we're left with two, um, really two scenarios. The one scenario is what the History Channel, with all due respect, and the ancient aliens and the ancient astronaut crowd are always trying to tell us that these beings came from Zeta Reticuli or the Pleiades. They were the ancient astronauts who we were visited thousands of years ago, the workings of Eric von Däniken. And that's the paradigm which has dominated the conversation literally for decades. But guess what? It's another paradigm. And that's the paradigm which I've written seven books about. And that is the idea that fallen angels once were here. In my opinion, Dr. Stamp, these sites that I mentioned, Sox de Waman, Oye Tintambo, Waitara, and others down in Peru, all bear resemblance to, the, to what we see happening in Egypt with the Great Pyramid. And this, again, in my opinion, is Nephilim architecture. There's a supernatural element to it. The, the hand of a man cannot duplicate this stuff, even <clears throat> today in modernity. And basically, of course, we've watched the DVD, and you'll see actually this architecture, these stones, beautifully crafted stone wall. And then uh, suddenly later on, another stone wall was built on top of that to make it higher. But it was nowhere near, anywhere near as well done as this one that was done thousands and thousands of years ago. I mean, I think that was really what was so amazing as we watched your DVD. Yeah, it, it, it's all in Watcher 6, and there's still photos, of course, that are in on the trail with Nephilim, but when, when we're there, I mean, and, and this is why it's just watching a DVD, getting the book, it, it's, it's, it's like you're there, you're, and we're walking through it, and we're, we're, we're taking our time to, to talk to Brian about it, and we're, we're, the stones that were quarried were called andesite, and these stones are very, very hard, and copper chisels cannot shape them or cut them. So here, I mean, you've got a real conundrum. You've got a real enigma happening here. The Inca, who, who when the Spaniards came to Sox de Waman and they saw it, they asked the Inca, who built these? You know what the Inca said? The giants built them. It was here when we got here. We found it. It was here already when we got here. That's what the Inca told the Spaniards. I mean, this stuff goes back thousands and thousands of years and speaks of a technology which has been lost. We have no idea. And, and, you know, Dr. Stam, some of these stones in Saksi Raman, and they're megalithic, they're huge, they weigh between 40 and over 120 tons. A 120-ton stone carried 40 to 60 miles that shaped some of these stones. One, one of my favorite ones is one of the big ones with 10 sides that you can see. 10 sides to that stone shaped. And guess what? All the other stones that are around it fit perfectly. And it's not just, they're not just dressing the front of the stone. These cuts go clear through the stone and this create, and they're polished surfaces. And this creates an interlocking, uh, web of, of stonework, which has withstood thousands of years, including all the earthquakes in Peru. Nothing has moved. It's astounding when you see it, when you, when your hand touches it, when I, when I stood next to it, uh, when I held it, you know, beheld it from, a, a elevated place and look down on it. Mind-boggling. Absolutely mind-boggling. And of course, you get the impression that there was a, a degree of intelligence that existed oh. thousands of years ago that does not exist today. I mean, certainly we can move massive stones, but we yes. have to have massive uh, cranes and things to do it. They didn't have massive cranes. They were able to move these things. And have you ever seen some of the stones over there, certainly on the wall of the uh, of Temple Mount of Israel? I mean, some of these stones are 40 feet long, 40 feet long and 15 feet high, and uh, maybe uh, 20 feet deep. How would you move a stone like that? You, human beings could not do that. So that almost as if there has to be another force there. And this is, I'm sure, the, the thought that there is a supernatural power these people tap into, which we don't understand. Yes. But then so much of what's going on today, you're not supposed to understand. You're not even supposed to question everything. You have to accept exactly what you're told by our, certainly our great museums like the Smithsonian, which is hiding many of these uh, uh, statues uh, of, of these creatures who were 12 or 14 feet tall or even taller. Go ahead. And we're there. We're looking at the stonework. And, again, there, there, it, it's one thing to talk about it and look at pictures, but when you're actually there on site, it's just, it's just mind-boggling. 
And I believe, Dr. Stan, that all these, all these, um, all this architecture was the remnant of some great civilization which covered the earth. And when we were in Watara, we, we came upon this Catholic church and the Catholic church built, um, over this site. And, and it's just, it's like night and day. You, you can see the original stonework, which is absolutely magnificent and perfect and so fine. Once again, that the joints, <clears throat> you can't stick a human hair between them. And above it is what I would call indigenous or Inca slop. It's mortar. It's just every rock. The joints are huge. And above that is Spaniard. And there's uh, Spanish. And there's the Catholic Church. Well, when you round the bend and you come into the courtyard, and I first looked at the wall, I turned to Richard, my partner in the Watcher series, and I said, "Oh my gosh, are we in Egypt or Peru?" Because the similarities between the structures. Is, is just so, just so obvious. And what we, we had this sort of a cosmic download, Dr. Stan, while we were in Cusco, r- ruminating on all the things that we had seen. <clears throat> and it, I've never had this with another human being before. But uh, Richard and I are walking in the streets of Cusco. We had just left dinner and we're talking about what we had seen and these artifacts and the fact that, uh, earlier on in another watchers we had been to the Dallas area where we went to a rock wall and we looked at that and there was like all these ancient architecture and something was going on and that's when it hit us and it's in the book and it, of course it's, it's, in, it's in the DVD that there was an ancient grid system. These stones have what's called piezoelectric properties. In other words, they can conduct electricity. These were not temples that were built. They were not temples. They were some sort of um, architecture which created either electromagnetic force fields or some type of a communication, and they were deliberately destroyed in some sort of a cataclysmic event. When we stood on Oye Tintambo, there's only one wall that's intact. Everything else has been destroyed. And you can see where something, in, something very forceful and cataclysmic came in and, and destroyed this, whatever it was, this area. And the stones are smashed. And then they're on the, on the valley floor below. And, it, and it's everywhere. Something happened. What our theory was, and we're not the first people to come up with this because New Agers have been talking about this for decades. There was a grid that the ancients set up. And this grid is not a good thing, Dr. Stan. And this leads even more mystery and, and more depth to when Jesus says, as, as in the days of Noah, so it will be when the Son of Man returns. We know that the fallen one will set up some sort of a global religion and global um, wor- worldwide government. We know that. The book of Revelation tells us that that's what's going to happen. Well, Jesus tells us it'll be like the days of Noah. And that statement is so pregnant with meaning, I believe I've just scratched the surface with it. There was an ancient grid that existed in the days of Noah that was destroyed. The fallen one has been trying to reestablish that grid over and over and over and over again. I'll just give you one, one little thing because I know we're running out of time before I come to the, to the punchline here. I interviewed a man by the name of Kelsey Stone, whose family, the Stone family, their grandfather bought this site, which they call America's Stonehenge. They've carbon dated it to 4,000 years ago. It's very, very old. Well, a henge is a circle, and this is, a, this is America's Stonehenge. That's what they've nicknamed it. And in the summer solstice, you can stand in the center of their circle and look out to a standing stone, which has been placed into the ground, and above that standing stone rises the summer sun, the summer uh, solstice uh, sunrise. And so Kelsey Stone's on Google Earth, and he decides to draw a line from the center of the hinge out to the standing stone and then extend it. So he does this, and he extends it and extends it and extends it and extends it further, and he goes across the Atlantic Ocean. But lo and behold, he winds up intersecting bisecting the center trilithon at Stonehenge directly in the center. You can't do that in the ancient world. I've gone to a surveyor in Malibu and asked, is there any way to do this in the ancient world? He says, no, you've got to be in the air to triangulate it to be that precise. He's gone thousands and thousands of miles, and that line intersects the center trilithon standing in Stonehenge, but way to get better. The Stonehenge in England, go ahead. Stonehenge in England. When he extends the line, remember, from New Hampshire to England, and it, and it bisects Stonehenge, the center trilithon, 
patrol sign is three, three, two, two pillars and a, and a cross stone. That's what patrol sign is. Okay? When he extends that line further, he winds up in Beirut, Lebanon. Beirut, Lebanon is the home of the Phoenicians. The Phoenicians were descendants from the Canaanites. The Canaanites were a Nephilim tribe. And basically, where is the American Stonehenge that you're describing? What's it's in New Hampshire. In New right. Hampshire, okay. New Hampshire. Ladies and gentlemen, th th these are things you're never going to hear elsewhere, but this is so vitally important. You understand that most of the truth you're never going to get from the major media because it's controlled. What is its purpose? Not to reveal, but to conceal the past. And basically, there was other races of people here, and there were giants in the land, just as we're told in the Bible. We'll be back in just a moment to wrap tonight's program with L.A. Marzulli. Well, L.A., we've got three minutes for you to wrap up the program. Thanks and then so we'll much, Dr. Go. Stan, for, for having me on. Looking forward to seeing you and Barbara, of course, in Colorado, along with Chuck Missler and Gary Stearman, Tom Horn, and, and a whole host of other wonderful speakers. So it's going to be a fun weekend. But let me just wrap it up by saying this, that that ancient grid that was destroyed thousands of years ago, and the fallen one, Satan, has been trying to reconstruct it, certainly with places like, like um, Fox Tewamon and like the Great Circle Mountain in Ohio. The grid is back, just like, we, just like he wants it, and we've helped him build it. That grid is the World Wide Web. Right now it's benevolent. It's not used to enslave the human humanity. But when the Antichrist comes, Dr. Stan, we know that you will not be able to buy, sell, or trade. And this grid of satellite and surveillance system, look at NSA, look at IRS, look what's going on, will be used to enslave every single human on this planet. This is why Jesus says, as in the days of Noah, and unless those days were shortened, no flesh would survive, which means he's got to come back. It's our only hope, our only answer is in the second coming to put down this evil enslavement which is about to happen. I certainly agree with you. I think we're entering into some very, very difficult times. We're looking forward, both Barbara and I are looking forward to seeing you uh, here in just a few days there in Colorado Springs. God bless. Thanks very much, Ellen. Thanks, Dr. Stan. Bye-bye. Well, this is Dr. Stan, and I hope you enjoyed the conversation with L.A. Marzulli. I think he's certainly one of the certainly most courageous people. He's out there working all across America, North America, and South America, trying to put together the pieces of this puzzle. And what is it to be coming up with? The fact that there were giants in our land as well as in in Sydney over in the, the Middle East, and suddenly going back thousands of years. And basically that there really are supernatural forces here. You hear all these stories about the uh, about the aliens and about the certainly the alien races and uh, these visitors from other planets. And this is all to confuse you so that you will not recognize that we're dealing with a spiritual battle and these are demonic beings and demonic forces. And there really is a supernatural element that you can tap into, but you tap into it at the risk of your eternal soul. Well, basically, of course, we do carry uh, Lynn's book, and it's a little expensive, but it has uh, really dozens of colored pictures in it. It's called Watcher 6, and you can get it by calling one 800 5448927. You'll find it fascinating. And he has something, you know, page after page after page of reproductions of the articles that come from newspapers and magazines a hundred years ago talking about the giants. And now, of course, everything is done to conceal that from the American people. And you're to believe what you're told by the media and you're told in school and you're told in college and you're told by the Smithsonian and other parts and parcel of this effort, organized effort to conceal seal the truth from the American people. And that is that we're involved in a spiritual battle for the souls of men and the survival of Christian civilization. And we're losing that battle because, of course, they've gained control of our certainly of, of the major elements of our society. They control our educational system. They've infiltrated our churches. They have their people planted in the media and the military and the banking and the corporations and in the government. And they're largely able to control what the American people think and believe. That's why you need to get my book, Brotherhood of Darkness. 
That's why you need to get the new uh, Professor Ben Bagdikian's book. It's called The New Media Monopoly. Now, Professor Bagdikian is a, is a left-wing college professor. He thinks that the right-wing controls the media, but his book is excellent. Uh, he just doesn't understand the Trilateral Commission and the Brotherhood of Darkness, but his book, The New Media Monopoly, we recommend to you. And then, of course, we certainly have all sorts of uh, information available to Radio Liberty to give you the background of what's taking place today. We have a four-CD set on the supernatural, a four-CD set on the supernatural, a four-CD set on satanic crimes. We have a book on satanic crimes. We certainly have Malachi Martin's excellent four-CD set. Uh, the wisdom of Malachi Martin. Malachi was a Jesuit priest, a confidant of Pope John the Twenty Third, and he tells you some of the most amazing stories about the Catholic Church. Stories that every uh, Catholic should understand. To in understand that their uh, religion has been infiltrated, just like the uh, Protestant religion has been infiltrated. There are dark and sinister spiritual forces that have captured controls of the reins of Christianity to neutralize the Christians in this country. And our job is to try to get them alarmed and educated. And that's why we hope that if you're out there in the listening audience, you go to our website, radioliberty.com. That's radioliberty.com. You can listen to our live programs there. For Four hours a day, you can certainly get our archive programs, and they're all archived. You can listen to them 24 hours a day. You have our permission to copy our, uh, certainly our uh, interviews and distribute them, even to copy our CDs and our, our DVD sets. And, but you need to get this information out. So many people are simply misled today and have no idea what is really going on in the world. And our job is to educate them, and that's why I do what I do five hours a day. And if you're in a position to help us uh, finance our uh, network of radio stations, we do have radio stations all across America. We have probably a close to uh, 14, 15 outlets for this one program. But we need your help to maintain our network. And if you're in a position to join the Radio Liberty family of support, We'll appreciate your help. And if you're not in a position, then we ask you to pray for Radio Liberty for our provision and our protection. And we'll be back here in, in just a moment. 